Spirit Connections. Hi everyone, it's always good to bear in mind that one of the principal aims of this channel is to show the evidence of life after death through spirit communication. How brave scientists, experimenters, researchers, mediums and the like all over the world have brought to us evidence of life beyond the grave. So, we're not here to pass any judgment regarding doctrinaire aspects of this or that medium. You see it and you judge it, but at the same time we painstakingly warn that mediumship, for instance, is something too serious to play with, and delving into the techniques alone is not enough because the challenges and obstacles are not small for those who intend to work with this paradigm-breaking activity, which does give rise to expansion of consciousness and Precisely because of that, we need to grow in ethics, love and understanding to reach fruitful outcomes and not fall into traps, for example, vanity, greed, and start a useless and dangerous quest for the spotlight. As Dr. Dean Rading says in his book Real Magic, dropping down the rabbit hole in the unknown is exciting, but it's not without risk. And in my practice, greed and vanity, for example, have proved to be risky pathways to follow. As far as my experience is concerned, I personally like and recommend Alan Kardec's works and criterion for that. Well, this time we'll be showing a family, the Harrisons and their friends, who were able to give support to a medium called Minnie, a person just like you and me, but who had the gift of releasing the so-called ectoplasm from her body, a substance through which spirits can perform healing, communications and materializations. Materializations can rule out many, if not all, alternative explanations to the thesis of the spirit. The upload of this video here was only possible with the very kind permission of Anne Harrison, Tom Harrison's wife, who gave us all the support and assistance for that. Tom's the late lecturer will be listening too. We also need to thank Jeremy Michael Bloxham, the original YouTube channel owner who got me in touch with Anne Harrison. Let's thank Anne and Jeremy and let's thank you all and let me thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy it. This is the story of a home circle held in Middlesbrough which produced the most amazing physical phenomena. The medium, Minnie Harrison, was a very rare and exceptional physical medium, and she was used by the spirit world to materialize hundreds of ectoplasmic spirit forms. Her son, Tom Harrison, was a member of that circle, and during the last 30 years, he has traveled the country extensively, giving talks and lectures about the circle and bringing help and comfort to many hundreds of people. Much of this story is filmed on location with Tom as he gives his talks in houses, churches and lecture halls. We had to contend with traffic noise, karaoke evenings, disco nights and many other noisy intrusions. Because of this, some of the quality of the film is not as good as it would have been had it been filmed in a studio setting. However, we felt that the atmosphere that is generated when Tom gives one of his lectures was well worth capturing on film. I do hope you agree. Tom, hello. Hello, Pat. The circle started in 1946 after you were demobbed from the army, didn't it? That's right. Would you like to tell us about it? Delighted. I was demobbed in March 1946 after serving seven years in the army. Uh, my mum and dad and Doris and I went round to Sid and Gaddis's on a Saturday night, purely as a social call. But after two or three weeks, Sid said one night, why don't we have a circle? So we said, why not? We were spiritualists, and my mother by that time had developed into a trans medium. We sat uh, in Sid and Gladys's sitting room behind their shop, um, which is an old shop, as you can see, with uh, Sid in his Sunday best and his dad standing there, Joe, good character. And my mother 
was the medium at the time, I say by then she'd be about 51. And she had developed into becoming uh, into a trance medium, a deep control trance medium, which meant that she completely went to sleep. She had no idea what was happening. Uh, we had to tell her afterwards what had happened, what had occurred. And the four members of our family, uh, as you can see, uh, I'm standing there with, um, with a bit of hair in those days, and then Doris is on my left, um, she was my first wife. My dad, who was known as Tosha, is sitting in front uh, of Doris, and then my mother is sitting next to my dad. The other two members at the beginning, when we started sitting, making six, were Sid and Gladys Shipman, uh, as you can see, who were our hosts and we simply sat in their living room behind that shop that you've seen. Within a, a short time, Mrs. Hildred, Gladys's mother, joined us um, because she was uh, interested. Her husband, Sam, had passed away in December 45, only a few months earlier, and she was interested to know what was happening uh, with Sam. And then, after about seven or eight months, Mr. Britton Jones joined us, uh, he was a surgeon and was the superintendent of the Middlesbrough General Hospital where Doris served her time as a nurse. So that was the eight of us uh, at a later stage. After all these years, how can you remember the details of everything that happened in the circle so precisely? Actually, it's very simple, Pat. You see, I don't rely on my memory. I have two books here in which I recorded just brief records after every sitting, I made notes of what happened so that I have it all in the books. And that's what's important, that you have the exact, precise records. Yes, indeed. When you give your talks, some of the audience may be very knowledgeable about spiritualism and, and psychic phenomena, yeah. and others will know absolutely nothing. How do you cope with that? Oh, very simple. I, at the very beginning, I simply give an explanation of the difference between mental phenomena and physical phenomena. That's all. For those of you who know very little about psychic phenomena, particularly physical psychic phenomena, what you're going to see tonight and what you're going to hear about, um, you may find, well, sometimes impossible. Uh, it'll certainly be mind-boggling to some of you if you don't know anything about it. Uh, and sometimes people even think it's fraudulent because it is so rare, extremely rare. But let me assure you that everything you see tonight, everything you hear about tonight, happened. And I was there. I'm not telling you something about somebody else that somebody else has told me about. I experienced all the things you're going to hear about between 1946 and 1954 in our home circle in Middlesbrough with my mother, Minnie Harrison, as the medium. So it's all fact that you will hear tonight, okay? Now, as I said, at the end of the talk, don't hesitate. You can come back and ask me questions. That'll be fine. I'm talking about a home circle, but let me explain the difference between mental phenomena and physical phenomena for those of you who may not understand. Mental psychic phenomena is where the medium, and the medium is nothing more than a television set or a radio set. Bear in mind that's all they are. They're only mediums for picking up the radio waves and the television waves going through the air. Now a medium is a person who picks up the spiritual vibrations, the psychic energy from either you or from the spirit people who are around us and they are around us all the time. They're here and they're with us. They don't interfere with our lives. They don't tell us what we have to do, but they're there to help us if we need it. In the same way that we go and ask um, other people if we want help about something. Well, we can ask our spirit friend, the same way as you could. Now, the medium who is a mental medium, only he or she hears or sees the actual happening. In other words, clair clairvoyance, which you may have heard of, they see clearly, they see spirit people. They see them either objectively or they see them 
kind of a little picture in their mind. Clear audience, clear hearing, they hear the spirit people talking to them. They can hear the messages, right? But only the medium knows that, senses it. With physical phenomena, it happens in the room, in the circle, a group like we are. It could happen if it happened here. Everybody in the room sees it and hears it. It is absolutely physical, which you will see on the photographs I'm going to show you later. Now, my mother was brought up in a spiritualist family, was a medium all her life in various ways. But by the time I had been was demobbed from the army in 1946, after the World War II, she had developed into a trans medium. Trans medium is where the person goes to sleep, deep trance. They literally just go to sleep and a spirit person takes over and uses their body and speaks to you. An entirely different person, a spirit person. That is trans control. My mother was controlled by her sister in spirit, Mrs. Abbott, and Ag to us, and you'll hear about and Ag quite a bit, and you'll see and Ag on the photographs, who was a medium when she was here too. She was a medium in London, but she also had her own home circle, the trumpet circle. I'll explain about the trumpet as I'm coming to it, but she had the trumpet circle. And she passed over in 1942, so she'd been passed over about four years. She controlled my mother. Now, the empathy between my mother and Aunt Ag was tremendous. My mother could be sitting in the chair, and she used to do this at home. Not do it, I mean, she was just sitting at home like we are here now, chatting away. And with a few moments, she'd just go. <sighs> and a smile would come, and there was Aunt Ag. As simple as that. Aunt Ag was a well-known medium in her own right, wasn't she? Didn't she feature in one of Arthur Findlay's books? That's right, yes. Yes, Aunt Ag, who was Mrs. Agnes Abbott, um, was a very well-known medium uh, on the earth plane. She was a trans medium uh, at the Marleybourne Spiritualist Association, which became the SAGB. Uh, and uh, in one of her sittings with Arthur Findlay, which I only found out, and while I was the founder manager of the, the Arthur Findlay College at Stansted Hall, that sh this sitting in April uh, 1928, she had given Arthur Findlay 92 correct facts, and he considered it so important that he included it in almost verbatim, I think, in one of his books, looking back, his autobiography, and as an appendix to his first book, uh, On the Edge of the Etheric. So we were very, very fortunate and privileged to have Aunt Ag as a medium uh, in our circle. Was Aunt Ag the only guide that controlled your mother? Oh no, no. My mother's main guide um, was a North American Indian called Sunrise, um, who in effect was the doorkeeper for the circle, making sure on the spirit side that mischievous spirits didn't uh, come in. Uh, and he could be likened, of course, to Aunt Ag's guide, Running Water. Uh, who did the same for Aunt Ag in her circles. As I said, we started off in April, and the first night my mother was controlled. Controlled by one of Aunt Ag's guides, strangely enough, running water, not her own guide, who said that if we sat for trumpet phenomena, we would achieve it. And we thought, well, this is crazy. No way could we get trumpet phenomena. But we did. Oh, ye of little faith, as I always say. So, uh, we did. Sid made a couple of trumpets, I made one. Cardboard, tin, wooden, and we stuck them on the floor, as I showed you in the middle. The third week, the third city, oh, by the way, we sat in the dark. For the trumpet phenomenon, we always sat in the dark. But, we had luminous spots at a later stage on the end of the trumpet, which you'll see, so we could always see where it was, where it was moving, where it was flying around the room as it did. 
uh, and then stop, and we got the voices through. But, we, but it was always in the dark. Materialization, which I'm moving on to later, was in red light. Quite different. However, at the end of the third city, <coughs> lights went on, not a lot had happened. We sang bright and cheerful songs, not a lot happened. Then Sid went over to move the trumpet. He picked the little cardboard trumpet up, took it, and he said, Who put that there? Looking at it all as. Mind you, there were only six of us then. Mrs. Hilda joined us about six weeks later, Mr. Jones about seven months later. Okay? We said, What? And on the floor was a small piece of white blossom, just like cherry blossom, underneath the trumpet. He said, well, somebody must have had it in their pocket. It must have fallen out of your pocket. Said, no, no, sir, no. No, it was our very first apport. <coughs> now, let me explain what happens for those who don't know. An apport is a material thing. It's not spiritual, it's not psychic. It is a physical thing, anything at all, a watch, a, a bell, a piece of paper, anything, brought into the room without physical contact. And what they do, spirit people dematerialize it, means it has no, no physical body, bring it through the wall, which doesn't exist as far as that's concerned, and then rematerialize it in the room. Sounds simple, doesn't it? It is to them, but they can't explain how they do it. <coughs> it's always difficult for them to explain how they do anything. I mean, I would make the analogy, you know, well, I'm sure you've heard it, how can you explain to a person who's been blind all their life what a colour is? You can't, can you? Because they do not have a vocabulary. You can't say green is like a leaf of a tree, because they don't even know what a tree is, they don't even know what the colour that is. That is the problem the spirit people have with explaining how they do things. So we can't always get the answers how, but they do it. And over the years, we've had hundreds of apples, hundreds of flowers particularly, and I'll explain more about the flowers perhaps when we come to the material. <coughs> over the years, you had a wide variety of apples, didn't you? Oh, gosh, yes. Yes, over the years, including such items as um, a Royal Artillery button, um, which came on one of our, what we call our soldiers' nights. Uh, the Saturday nearest to November the 11th, we always called soldiers' night, because in those days there was the armistice, uh, where we had the two minutes silence. And on another occasion, on one of those nights, we had this beautiful poppy, the, uh, but it was a cloth poppy, uh, not one of the, the current plastic ones. And then when sunrise came, sunrise built on the 52nd sitting, the anniversary, he built complete with his headdress and then brought with him an apport of a feather, this lovely orange feather which was brought. Where he got it from we don't know, but he brought that with him as well. Of course, in addition to the apports I've just mentioned, we were so privileged in January 1954 at a special sitting to receive as an apport, this wonderful little bell, this Indian temple bell, which you can hear ringing. And one of the interesting matters about it is that it has not lost its shine. After all these years? After all these years, it That's still retains its shine. That is amazing. It is. By the fifth week, we had a voice through the trumpet. This is remarkable progress. Five weeks sitting. People sit for years and get nothing. I know. We were so privileged. But what we hadn't realized also was that for those war years, when my mother and father and Doris were going around there, spirit people were building power. They were creating an energy in that room, which when we started sitting, they were able to draw and use that was there, so that by the fifth week, one of the trumpets lifted. We couldn't see it because we didn't have luminosity on those then. We couldn't get luminous paint. 
not then, we got it late. But the trumpet lifted. We knew we could hear something. And we just heard a voice. I am trying. I am trying. That's all for now. It was Aunt Ag, one of my mother's sisters, I said. It was a voice to a trumpet in the fifth week. Tremendous. To have trumpet phenomena after the fifth week was really exceptional, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely exceptional. Some people sit for years and years and get no phenomena. But that, of course, was only the beginning. But when we had hundreds of voices through the trumpet over the years, uh, and a particular man was Sam Hildred, Gladys's dad, who had such an affinity with the trumpet. He came most weeks, he could speak through it so clearly in exactly the same way as he used to when he was living here. Um, other people found it rather difficult, and it isn't easy for the spirit people to learn the technique of speaking through the trumpet. But Sam mastered it and used it regularly. During the next oh, 30 weeks, we had so many different kinds of phenomena, and leading up to full, I mean, to trumpet phenomena, which came every week from that week on, we had spirit lights, small lights just shining, going off, shining, going off, all part of the development. They only happened for a few weeks, it was all part of the development. We had spirit writing. And I don't mean automatic writing. We used to put a piece of paper on a board, pin it to the board with a pencil, and I sat, if this is the fireplace, and I'm here, my mother's over there, and we're sitting around, put the board on the hearth near me, so I, know nobody, I knew nobody would get enough to do anything. And somebody I'd say, shh, listen, listen. And you could hear the pencil moving on the paper. And in here, which I hope you'll come and have a look at when, this, when we finish the meeting. In here you'll see some of the writing that was done. This is the actual writing that was done on that board. Now it's on old account paper because you couldn't get paper after the war so we tore a couple of sheets out of Gladys's accounts book from the shop <laughs> so we could do. There's a circle there which is sunrise. Now sunrise was my other my mother's other main guide the North American Indian. He was the link man, and Ag was the connection, if you like, personal, but Sunrise was the controller. He was the one who made sure everything was right from the spirit world to us. Uh, Jack, Agnes, and Ag signed. Mona, Ivy, okay? You can come and look at them when I've finished. The, I put the dates on. Some more over there, the same, different names. More again here. So for a few weeks, we had this spirit writing occurring. And in fact, the last thing was not blind now. So we thought, oh, I wonder what that is. So we only knew what was there when we put the lights on. So next, the following week, then we ask, what was there, who was this? And they said, well, it was Mr. Carroll Pugh, who was a good friend of the family's. He'd been blind when he was here. He was in the spirit world, and he'd putting not blind now. <laughs> Great. So come sitting number 25, and I spoke through the trumpet and told us that they were trying to get materialization, ectoplasmic materialization. Now, I won't explain what ectoplasm is at the moment because you, I'll explain it when I come to the actual slide. So ecto, well, it's, it's a material, it's a solid material, ectoplasm. That's the first thing. It's not ghostly, it's not airy fairy, it's a solid material. It is vibrant. It is a material between the spirit world and the physical world, which links the two, but it is solid. And they can do anything with it. They can make it any way they want. Okay? So and actually they were experimenting. And we saw in front of the plaque, we painted a plaque, we saw fingers first. Then we saw a hand. Then we saw two hands, different sized hands. And the plaque was moved round by the spirit people, not by us, moved round this, the room so that we could all see the hands. And then we were allowed to touch them. 
You ask if you can, of course. You know that. You don't do anything without asking permission from the spirit people. You work in cooperation. You give, they give, the same thing. We all then receive. Pastor, and then we touch them. Just like our own hands. Flesh hands. Walk. Just the same. So we saw hands. And then, sitting number 32, in particular. And I will say this was the one that was out of this world. Well, certainly to me. We're sitting around. By now we'd asked, could we have a red light? We always wanted, we were not uh, naive, we were not gullible. We wanted to know that what happened was actually true. Was happening was spirit, not anything else. So we said, would it be possible to have a red light for the materialization? We got permission to have a red light. And I have here, believe it or not, 50 years later, the actual red light. The same piece of glass with which we took some of these photographs you'll see. And inside is the actual bowl, which still works, 50 years later. They don't make them like that now, do they? They did then. So, we had the red light. So here we are, sitting in the room, my mother, I'm sitting here, my mother's there, one, two, three strides away, no more, one of the fireplace, the other people sitting round. Red light on, we're just sitting quietly, we'd sang our songs, bright and cheerful songs, sitting quietly. And we all sit, so I said, what's that? Look, look, in the middle of the room there. We saw this whiteness. What we say whiteness in a red light, but it was it was a type of whiteness building up. We said, oh, it looks go out, look. It looks like ectoplasm, doesn't it? Yeah, we saw this build up. My mother's still sitting there. Don't forget, she's not in the cabin room. She's sitting there. It's built up. Has it built up? He said, oh, yes, look. And as I'm looking at it, I'm saying it because it wasn't anything then, it turned. And I could see there was a face. And then, as it turned towards me, Two hands and arms came out towards me. And I'm sitting there a bit apprehensive. I wasn't frightened, because I'd been to Helen Duncan's. I'd sat in Helen Duncan's circle before the war. But these two arms came out. And took hold of my, I put mine out, took hold of mine, and put into my hand were four carnations. And they were apples. And Dag, who the lady was standing there, had brought me four carnations. She said, for you, for you. Turned and went. And I'm sitting there. I can feel it now. I was holding those carnations so tightly in that hand. No need to. They wouldn't disappear. They were an apple. They'd have stayed. I could have laid them on the floor. No way. And I think in today's phrase, the word is gobsmacked, isn't it? <sighs> and Dad, who had passed over four years ago, stood there, giving me four carnage. <coughs> Wonderful. That was our first full materialization. We were then told that we could have guests, you know, people like yourselves. We had, oh, a couple of hundred people over the time. And we said, right. And I said to Sid, what about Mr. Jones? We know he's interested. Uh, never mind how, he, how we found out, but we found out he was interested, which through Doris as a nurse, actually. He said, yes, yes, ask him. So we met him in the village, as we called it, just in the Myrtle Hooks, actually, and told him we had this circle, we had materialization, would he like to come? Oh, when? Tonight? 
No, not this night, Mr. Jones. Next Saturday. Right. He was there in Saturday. Now, you've got a, a surgeon, a medical man, highly respectable and well, you know, respected throughout the Northeast. <coughs> not a man given to, God bless you friends, that'll do, you know this thing I'm talking about, none of that. We were investigative people. Love and harm, but we didn't accept naive. Neither did he. So that night when Dad came, she built me. Talked away. Talked to us. Was that talking to us? And then she told me a few words to Mr. Jones, and she said, Perhaps Mr. Jones could come again sometime. He said, Yes, yes, lovely. But Mr. Jones either didn't or didn't want to hear the word sometime. It wasn't the next Saturday, but the following Saturday, the doorbell rang just before we started, opened the door, it's Mr. Jones. Good evening, good evening, and any steps. But we couldn't say, no, 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 you weren't supposed to come in. But you see, he had to come, he became part of it. And through his <coughs> knowledge of infrared photography, we were able to take some infrared photographs, which you will see tonight, 50 years ago, 40 years ago. <coughs> Very different equipment from before, but I'll show you that later. But it was through having Mr. Jones there. So nothing happens by accident, does it? He had to join us, he became part of the circle. And I built, he saw her, had a few words, when we finished, he said, um, as we're having our cup of tea, he said, you know, there's one thing I would have liked. And we said, yes, Mr. Jones. He said, I would have liked to have felt Mrs. Abbott's pulse. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? <laughs> we never thought about it. But there's the medical brain, you see. I'd like to feel her pulse. Hmm. Well, we'll ask next week, Mr. Jones. Certainly, it's possible. Right. Next week came, sitting there. And I built it. Before the word was said, she said, Good evening, Mr. I think. She just turned to Mr. Jones, you know, two strides away, and said, Mr. Jones? Yes, Mrs. Abbott. They were always very polite to each other. It was Aunt Ag and Pop, but to them, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Abbott. <coughs> yes. I understand you would like to take my pulse. Here's Aunt Ag ectoplasmic materialized person standing there saying to Mr. Jones, oh, I understand you'd like to take my pulse. Yes, Mrs. Abbott, I would. Of course, she'd been listening, hadn't she, last week, while we are having our cup of tea. She heard him say, so we didn't have to ask. Right. So she said, all right. She just held out her arm, lifted the robe, which you'll see on the photograph, I'll explain that later, lifted the robe, he stood up, his fingers on, in the correct way, in the true way, just stood up and stood there. About half a minute, he did, he did absolutely properly, as I call it. Thank you, Mrs. Abbott. You live. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, the pulse was there. The strong pulse was there. She said, thank you, Mr. Gerald. I am living, and I will continue to. Isn't that wonderful? A materialized person standing there saying to Mr. Jones, yes, Mr. Jones, I am living and I will continue. And of course she is, as they all are. It seems as if Mr. Britton Jones became a real asset to the circle. Oh, oh he certainly did. He was an amazing asset, uh, and particularly the experiment he carried out um, in May 1947, where he was given permission to cut a piece of ectoplasm from Antag's ectoplasmic robe, which was then put into a jar, which was on the mantelpiece at the time. Uh, it stayed in the jar uh, in, a, in a liquid which the spirit people had added as an apport until about the Wednesday of the following week. Mr. Jones then took it away with him to the hospital, centrifuged it, and came up with a crystalline substance very similar to bleach uh, and this agreed 
with Schrenk Notzing's uh, findings when he did a similar experiment many years previously with the medium Eva C. But do let me stress here and now to you all that before you do any experiments of this nature you have the full permission and authority of your spirit helpers because the safety of the medium who is in complete trance at the time is of paramount importance. Never forget that. When were you able to start taking photographs of these materialised spirits? Uh, October 1947 was the first one and the very first one we took um, all hit and miss by the way we weren't sure it would get anything because it was all taken in a simple red light not a very bright red light but sufficient and the first one is of Granny that's Granny Lumsden standing by the side of the fireplace and you can see alongside her there's a chair an empty chair um, where um, my mother had been sitting for the trumpet phenomena and the same night we had uh, and Ag, uh, who came out uh, from the cabinet and sat down on the chair. Now you can see I mentioned the chair in the previous one with Granny. Well, there's and Ag sitting on that chair, uh, fully materialised spirit, with my father on the left-hand side as a member of the circle. And Ag sat there chatting away to us. You can see moving her head backwards yes. and forwards. Yes. <laughs> and you can see her arms there. Yes. And we just said to her, chat away, and Ag. It doesn't matter if you move because we may not get anything. But we did. We were delighted. And then, oh, a couple of months later in January 1948, we were able to take some more photographs. And this is one of Antag. Unfortunately, we must have set the camera slightly wrong on the focusing. But you can see more detail of Antag. Oh, yes, you can see the face more, more can't you? Yes. Um, and you can see the hand. So this was a big improvement. Uh, and it was a slightly brighter light as well. The exposure times varied from two minutes to seven minutes. And the same night was this one. This is another one of Granny, Granny Lumsden, the little Granny. Uh, as the camera was set on a tripod, the same tripod all the time, you can see the difference in height between Granny Lumsden and Aunt Ag. So uh, again, we were delighted to have this of Granny, uh, and I found a photograph recently of her taken not long before she passed over and boy it is exactly like her. <laughs> it's lovely. Now Granny Lumsden was your first wife's grandmother. That's Correct. Right. Doris's yes. grandmother. And she was obviously small. <laughs> oh about four foot eleven I think. A really chatty person who used to dash around helping Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, looking after the bairns. You know in the old terrace houses in Middlesbrough uh, that was her nature and she was just the same when she used to build in the middle of the circle standing there talking to us chatting away to our visitors or to ourselves in her typical Middlesbrough voice. <laughs> no different. Same Granny. Granny used to build first, as I said, and she used to come out full of life. She had a little Middlesbrough piping voice. And in fact, I have a tape recording of them, of Granny and Aunt Agon, which we took a few years later. But she came out um, and chatted away to people. And when we had visitors, guests, she used to go up to them and shake them by the hand and say, hello, love, nice to see you, and even though she didn't know them, you know, and chat away. And then one night she said to the, the guest, she said, would you like to feel me feet, love? <laughs> so I'm, I said, Granny, what did you say, Granny, feel you feet? Yes, yes. I thought perhaps she might like to feel me feet. I said, well, why should you want, she want to feel your feet? You shook hand. Ah, oh, well, she said, you see, when I lived here on this side, she said, I was warm, but my feet were always stone cold. Oh, she said, I suffered with cold feet. And she said, when I get back into this stuff, she called it this stuff, she said, the same thing, I'm warm, but my feet are cold. I said, are they? Yes, she said. I said, come on, so we're gonna, this is the, the kind of atmosphere, the chatting away. So I said, come on, so I went over. This lady was a little bit, you know, <laughs> hold a foot of a materialized spirit person. So I bent down and said, come on then, put your foot up. And I lifted her foot and held her foot in my hand. And it was stone cold. It really was. I said, good heavens. And I felt, I said, let's find your hand. That was quite warm. And then she said, well, I told you, didn't I? <laughs> you know, and she said, I told you it was cold, right. She did this a few times when we had guests like that. Laugh, good laugh. And then one week when we had no guests, I said to Granny, I said, hey, Granny, are your feet cold tonight still then? Oh, no, no, not tonight. I said, now, come on. You said that when you get into this stuff, your feet are always cold. Yes, they are. That's right. 
So I said, well, what do you say? Well, she said, we haven't got any guests tonight, have we? Any people, any visitors? I said, so what? Well, she said, I haven't brought my feet. <laughs> I said, you what? She said, I haven't brought my feet. She bent down, lifted up the gown that you'll, that's down here, and you'll see it on it, pulled it up, waist high, and there was nothing. Granny is standing there, moving around the room, and nothing below the waist. And I could see my father through the other side. <laughs> oh. I said, oh, all right. She dropped the gun down and still moved about. You see, isn't it wonderful what they can do? We can't understand it and we can't explain it. They can't explain it to us. But that's the wonderful part about it. There she was, complete, but no feet, no legs. And I got, we had a good laugh. So that was Granny, okay? I had to tell you that one about Granny. We had a good laugh about that. Now, in February 1948, we took another couple, uh, and these were taken with film rather than plate. And this is one of my grandfather. Now, that's my mother's father. Here you can see my father on the left again as a member of the circle. And that's my grandfather standing quite tall as he was, you can see alongside the fireplace, complete with beard, and remember that all you are looking at there is ectoplasm, material ectoplasm, which is connected to the medium, my mother, who's sitting behind the curtain uh, that you can see behind Grandad. Oh, now this uh, is much clearer, isn't it? Yes. yes. Now this, this was, uh, again, Antag, in a brighter red light. Now again, I often say on this one, there's my father still sitting in the same place as he usually does. He looks like the spirit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with two ears, two noses, and the rest of him. Uh, and Aunt Ag, st that's Aunt Ag standing there, um, looks the, uh, the solid person, which she was. I mean, that is all ectoplasm again. Uh, you can see a difference in the texture when it gets to the bottom of the uh, gown, uh, much finer. And then remember, as I've said, that is all linked underneath the curtain back to my mother. But that was a wonderful photograph of Aunt Ag. Uh, and we always enjoyed listening to her talks. Oh, that's an enlargement now of yes, Van Dag. Yes, that's an enlargement yes. of Van Dag. Yes, it's, it's very, the face it's is very clear. Very clear it? indeed, yes. There is a question often asked, if I may add this, is people often ask me, why do they have this white robe around the face, the head? Yes. Why can't you see the hair? And the simple answer is uh, that taking a photograph takes a tremendous amount of energy, uh, a lot of power, and to save the energy, to conserve the energy, they only they keep the robe around the face. But other times when they built, um, we could see the hair. Oh, oh I see. They, they didn't. Oh, they no. weren't like that. Not always. Oh, I see. No, yes. no, 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 no. Yes. This was um, particularly for the photographs because they took so much energy to take the photographs. That's that was a particular reason. Right. Oh, no, this one is quite spectacular. Right. This it? is quite different. Now here, we, the ones you've been looking at were all taken in red light we could see the people standing there in front of us. Now these uh, that are following, there are three of them, were taken in inf with infrared photography through Mr. Jones. He had the knowledge of infrared photography, uh, he also had the facilities, uh, and he could obtain the equipment that we needed to take it. Now this is showing you how the trumpet operated, well in our circle. Uh, it was taken in complete darkness with a ratten filter and there's a lot of technical stuff, but just to let you know that we had no idea what would be on the photograph. Yes, it was in darkness. Took the photograph, and this is it. You can see the ectoplasmic tube or rod coming out of my mother's vo um, mouth. She's sitting in complete trance on the chair in front of the fireplace there. And the ectoplasmic rod goes down and also coming from her solar plexus, joining the end of the trumpet. And you can see it's solid because you can see the shadow of the trumpet on the mantelpiece. And you can see the shadow of the ectoplasm. Yes, you can. Quite solid, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's quite see. solid. And they build a voice box usually in... Or they, they can build a voice box in the end of the trumpet, the narrow end, and use that. Or, more frequently, they use my mother's voice box, but speak with their own voices, and then transfer the voice down the ectoplasmic tube through the trumpet, which of course only amplifies the sound, which is the purpose of the trumpet. This 
incredible, really. It's a it? great photograph, is that, and it's been used many, many times uh, in quite a number of publications. Yes. Oh, now. <laughs> ah, yes. This is it. where we were getting a little bit um, optimistic, and a bit cheeky, perhaps, I often say, and we said, well, we'd like to know how does the ectoplasm come from my mother behind the curtain? You've seen Aunt Ag and Grandad and Granny standing there, and I've said to you that my mother's behind the curtain, and the ectoplasm is coming from her. Well, this is showing you how. This again with infrared photography in the dark, and you can see the ectoplasm pouring out of my mother's voice. My mother's sitting in the corner in complete trance, and it just draped. They draped it over her knees so we could see it. You can see. How, what it's diaphanous, isn't it? You mm. can see through yes. it. It's so light. Yes, it is. It's so. It's like voile when you feel it. It's so soft. Um, but uh, what yes. did your mother think when she saw this <laughs> photograph? Uh, I'm just <laughs> going to say to you, Pat. When Mum saw this, she went, "Ugh, is that what they do to me? Oh dear!" And frankly, if it had been me, I think I'd have said, oh, "That's enough. I don't think I want to sit in." <laughs> no, not Mum. She continued to sit for many years after this was taken. Oh, yes, yes. Now, this one is really exceptional. We had hoped and asked, was it possible to get a photograph of my mother and Aunt Ag together, which we thought would be lovely, the two sisters together. So they said they would experiment and see, but that would take a tremendous amount of energy, far more than the others. So again, we had no idea what would be on this photograph, taken in complete darkness with the infrared photography. But in fact, this is a spirit baby. My mother at that time is standing by the fireplace where you saw Aunt Ag standing, and Grandad. She is in complete trance and is in fact being controlled by Aunt Ag at that time, we were told later. And the ectoplasmic spirit baby, which I always say it looks like a doll. <laughs> oh yes, it looks like a doll. Well, I it's know. got a nose. It has a proper nose, which yes. somebody did point out. Yes, and dolls don't usually have proper Not, noses. No, they no. don't. Um, and that, in fact, is Aunt Ag's grandson, who was born about three or four months previously and passed over about two days old. Oh, really? Yes, so okay. she brought her own grandson as an experiment uh, to our circle. Unfortunately, we never got the photograph of my mother and Aunt Ag yeah, together. together. No, because by now my mother's health was still reasonable, but she'd had cancer since 1940, and she'd had a number of operations. Um, so we didn't, unfortunately, get the other photograph. But this is quite an unusual one. It is, indeed. Mm. Apart from yourself, Sid and Gladys Shipman are the only ones left of the circle now, aren't they? Yes, that's right. Well, on the earth plane. Yes. <laughs> All the rest is still living, of course, but in the spirit world. Yes. Oh, yes. And Sid is 91 on March, still fit. Gladys getting on towards her 80s. Both very active. Even Sid goes up and down Robin Hood's Bay Bank, which is where they live, <laughs> on a Sunday morning. I couldn't even do that. No, no, no. <laughs> I did say to him, uh, is it not bit? he said, oh, well, I have to pause for a breath occasionally. <laughs> Anyhow, they're great people, lovely people. And here are just a few of their memories when we visited them not long ago. Jack Graham was very good when he came, wasn't he? Do you remember Jack coming? Yes, Jack Graham came. He, he was a very nice chap. And uh, he had been a Plymouth Brethren. And he fell out with a Plymouth Brethren. And... Uh, uh, he was talking to Tom and Tom told him about our circus, so eventually we gave him an invitation. Do you know it took us a full year before Jack Graham was able to come to our circle? Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. It was. It, 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 when we invited people, it wasn't said they were coming next week. No. Mm. However, I remember Jack Graham, a voice came through the trumpet and said, Hello, Jack. Who is it? It's Edna. 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 And Jack was Edna, who? Oh. Your cousin Edna. Well, good pals work with Jack. Oh, my cousin Edna. Well, you know, I think it was a month after that that Jack Graham always got up on a Sunday morning to make his wife a cup of tea. And he didn't get up, he was dead. He mm. died in bed. It was a week. Oh, it was only a week, was it? Yes. 
But within a month he was talking through this trumpet in our circle. And we said, Jack, well, what, how did you find yourself at Pastover? He said, uh, it was it, uh, my cousin who met me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He said it was a great help. The fact that he knew that there is life after death. You see, it's such a, an important factor of this knowledge that it made it easy for me. So we said, well, have you met any of your old friends, your Plymouth brethren? Yes, he says, and they lie in a stupor. <laughs> yes. Lying in a stupor, yes. And when you go and shake and say, come on, you passed on, you know. How can I be passed on? I'm in the physical body. I'm not passed on. I can't be passed on. They're so stupid in that belief of how it's like hypnotic. They're in that hypnotic trance because of their beliefs. Now, that's a fact, what happens in the spiritual world. Yes. Well, I, I didn't know anything about psychic matters or life after death or anything until I met up with Sid. And uh, also about the same time we met up with Mrs. Harrison, Tom's mother, because Tom's father worked close to my dad. And, but at the same time, I always thought, well, what is the point of this life if there's nothing after it? I always used to think that. But anyway, then I got to know Sid and I went to the spiritualist church and then you heard all about the circle. We got into the circle and then my dad died on Christmas Day, 45, and he soon was talking through the trumpet. And of course, I had a brother in the spirit world and a sister in the spirit world, and they used to communicate as well. So it was a very great help to me. And, of course, I met a, such a lot of people. I always said uh, I would have liked to have been more mediumistic, but I never was. But I always made a cup of tea afterwards, so... <laughs> yeah, finish, that used to finish off the meeting, a cup of tea. And your brother used to do the lights? Oh, yes. Yes, we had some wonderful lights that my brother, he'd gone into the electrical department, as you might call it, in the spirit world. And we had some wonderful flashing lights, real big ones. And sometimes we got little lights in our bedroom, didn't we? Yes. We got lights in our bedroom sometimes. Yes. Oh. Uh, but he, he passed over just as a wee baby. Mm -hmm. But my sister was 12, and her job in the spirit world, she said, was looking after other babies and, and young children that had passed over. Mm. And that was, that was her job, and I think she was quite happy doing that. <laughs> I love that bit about yeah. the electrical department in the spirit oh, world. I thought she was going to say Devon's. That's wonderful. <laughs> uh, well done, Gladys. <laughs> you had many visitors to the circle, didn't you, over oh, the years? Oh, yes. Oh, well over 200 over the years. Um, but there was one special visitor, I spoke, Colonel Roy Dixon Smith, who came, uh, and I let Sid tell you about his visit. Okay? Yes. There was an advertisement in the Psychic News no. from uh, uh, Colonel Dixon Smith and uh, he was studying psychic phenomena and uh, he hadn't seen materialisation. Could anyone oblige him with that, to give him an invitation so that he could witness materialisation? So I asked the rest of the circle and they said, yes, we're, we're going to write and see what it's about. So I got a very nice letter back to say he'd be delighted if he could attend our circle. So it was all fixed up and uh, he came. And I met him at the station and uh, Gladys uh, was able to let him have a bedroom to sleep in. And uh, he, his wife materialised as well as speaking through the trumpet. And he devoted a chapter in his book to his visit to our Middlesbrough circle about the joy of his wife materialising mm. and uh, he, th he was profuse in his thanks and he sent us ultimately a copy of his book which we still have. Mm. I tracked down two visitors to the home circle in Middlesbrough last year, Cora Walker and Gwen Schlegel. This is how they looked when they actually attended the circle. 
And this is what they told me about it when I saw them. Gwen, right. you and your sister Cora are in a rather special situation because yeah. you were actually visitors to the Harrison Home Circle, weren't you? We were, yes. Can you tell me how long ago that was? Well, it is a long time ago, and I would estimate about 40 years. It was before my daughter was born, and she's now 38. So I think about 40 years. Would you say that, Cora? Yes. About, about, about 40 yeah. years. Yeah. And after 40 years, can you still remember what happened? Oh, I can, because it was, it was so special and so wonderful that it, it's something that stayed with me and will to the day I die. Um, you were telling about Granny Lums. Oh you? yes, well actually I was invited to this circle with Cora and Cora's husband also and my mum because I worked with Tom you see and we talked a lot about it at work and he got permission from the spirit world for us to go and you know be visitors at yeah. the circle and um, I must admit I was very very terrified at the thought of it and um, I am an early person and I wasn't looking forward to it to one, one little bit. However, we went and uh, we were sitting in the back room initially and Tom's wife was chatting away, sitting knitting and I was so scared I didn't hear a word she was saying and uh, I couldn't understand how she could calmly sit knitting when we were going to have this frightening experience as I thought. However, the time came for us to go into the room and um, it was just totally different to how I'd expected it to be. Um, firstly, we had um, these lights, which I vividly remember, because these just took my breath away. These are spirit lights? Spirit lights, yes. yes. Up in the corner, um, Tom's mum was behind a curtain in the corner, and all these lights were indescribable. They were flashing away and they were very, very bright, beautiful colours, um, which just amazed me. And then soon after that, the materialised spirits started to come and the first person to come was Grandma Lund Lumsden, or I think it was Lumsden, Lumsden, yes. I think that was the name. And she was so natural and normal and friendly that she just put us all at our ears, didn't she, Cora? Yeah. And she yeah. came to each one of us in <coughs> turn and shook hands with us and it was just taking hold of a, an old lady's hand warm, but it was an old lady's hand, and she spoke to us all, chatted to us, welcomed us there, and made you feel completely at ease, you see. So you've shaken the hand of a, a person who's been dead for a number of years. Most decidedly. And it felt just like a normal hand to you. Exactly, it old exactly. Hand. It was unbelievable, but there it is. And she spoke to you and she was chatty? She was very chatty. It was marvellous. Yes. She took all our fear away. Yeah. Cora, you, you, you told me that you, you saw your mother's sister there. Could you, could you tell us about that? Yes, I'd like to tell you. Um, she was called Jane, my Aunt Jane, who while she'd been on the earth was both deaf and dumb. However, we loved her greatly and whenever she came to see us, um, she used to mouth the words to me, I love you. Now, in the circle, when she came in her materialised form, and she looked at me and spoke those words. So she spoke She you. spoke those mm. words, I love you. So she wasn't deaf and dumb then? She was the not. World. No, she was not. It was and you the were saying wonderful experience. She was, she was quite a small materialisation. Yes, she, she didn't materialise to her full height. Uh, that was her first time of um, materialising and uh, Tom Harrison explained to us later that he uh, likened it to a person who was coming out of a, say, a river soaking wet in fully clothed, which you would find it obviously difficult to stand up properly. Um, yes, it's, uh, and as I say, that experience and all the other people that came that night was the most wonderful experience of uh, my life and feel very privileged to have uh, had that experience. Mm. And like Tom has said in his talk, how he um, likes to spread what he knows, uh, I feel exactly the same. Um, anybody who um, wants to know about 
spiritualism. I'm always pleased to tell them to mm. tell them what I know. Um, and how do you feel about dying now, Cora? Oh, oh not <laughs> no, fear, no fear, no fear whatsoever. In fact, yeah. it sounds very strange, but I'm quite looking forward to it. True, true. I think it'll be wonderful, really. I obviously don't want to go to leave my loved ones here, but I'm really excited at the prospect. I have complete, hundred percent certainty. Oh, certainty. There's mm -hmm. no. No, and what do, you, what do you say to these people who say, oh, you couldn't possibly have seen that, you've just been hallucinating? I just simply tell them that one day they'll find out for themselves. Oh, that's mm -hmm. what I do. That's very mm -hmm. good. One thing we haven't mentioned so far is that you managed to get a tape recording of materialised spirits' voices, didn't you? We did. We were extremely fortunate. Uh, on this particular night, which was in January 1954, the night that the bell came as an airport, we had a number of people talking through the trumpet and a number of materialisations. And amongst them uh, were Ann Dag and Granny, and I just stood in front of them with the microphone of the tape recorder and spoke to them, and then they recorded their voices and their messages. They were wonderful just to have them there in person, quite solid. Yes. So we'll let Ann Dag have the last word, shall we? That'll be splendid. Nothing better. And thank you. Tom. Thank you very much. From those loved ones of yours who have gone just a step farther, they say that they will always be near you, watching you and helping you. In this, your work for the truth of spiritualism. Go forth into the world and give your message, a message of life after death. Good night and God bless you all.